So in the last class, we talked about electromagnetic induction, and we talked about the case of motional induction. This class, we're going to talk about electromagnetic induction, and we're going to talk about the case of um, uh, what we call transformer induction. Uh, so transformer induction is electromagnetic induction. It's induced currents, induced EMFs, when there's no moving parts. Last class, motional induction. Motional induction is electromagnetic induction. It's induced currents, induced EMFs, when there are moving parts. And so um, these two classes cover the cases of motional induction with moving parts, um, transformer induction without moving parts. Uh, in today's class, we'll introduce the concept of inductors and inductance, which are circuit components, electrical circuit components. Like previously, before test one, we introduced the concept of capacitors and capacitance, which are circuit components. So that's something we're introduced. We'll also talk about energizing and de-energizing, kind of activating, deactivating an inductor, like we previously talked about energizing, de-energizing, or activating, deactivating a capacitor. So when we talk about inductors today, it will parallel work on capacitors previously. And so we'll draw on our work on capacitors as we work through inductors today. I just want to stress again, in, in science or in physics, this is a big deal, so I keep talking about it. Um, that this is a remarkable law. Faraday's law is a remarkable law. I mean, it's remarkable because of the science in it and the technology was in it, but it's a remarkable law as an equation or a law because it describes two distinct phenomena, which is unusual for a law. So it describes both an effect of motional induction and an effect of transformer induction that at their hearts, at their cores, have rather different explanations. So it's one law explaining two phenomena. That's very unusual. OK. So let's start with, uh, let's start on tra transformer induction. And I'm going to start by talking about um, two circuits and transformer induction. And then we're going to move on to one circuit and, and transformer induction. And the key point is that two circuits, two electrical circuits, actually can communicate with one another through empty space without being connected physically to one another with wires. So they can literally communicate with one another um, through empty space. And that's what your cell phone does. That's what your um, laptop does when you use wireless. So this is the ph phenomena of transformer induction. We've got a circuit on the, on the left-hand side here, and we've got a circuit on the right-hand side. Uh, the circuit on the left-hand side has a power supply. It has a switch, which we can open and close. And it has a coil, or a solenoid, or a loop of wire. The circuit on the right-hand side, that has a, a meter that can measure the current or a meter that can measure the voltage. And that's connected to a second coil or a second solenoid or a second loop of wire. These two circuits are not physically connected. These two circuits are separated by empty space. What we learn is that if I was to close the switch, on circuit number one. At that moment, I close the switch. At that, just at that instant, I close the switch. There is a induced current, induced EMF, in the right hand circuit, circuit two. If I open the switch on circuit number one, so it, it was activated, I'm going to open that switch. At that very moment, at that very instant, there's an induced EMF, an induced current in circuit 
number two in the circuit on the right hand side. So those are examples of circuit one, circuit two, communicating with one another through empty space. Circuit one is kind of talking, and circuit two is kind of listening. And um, when things change in circuit number one, um, things happen in circuit number two. That's the communication. Um, in this particular example, right, when we switch on circuit number one, and then we switch off circuit number one, the changes, the induced currents, the induced EMFs that happen in circuit number two, um, when circuit number one switched on, switched off, they're, they're opposite. So it's opposite directions of currents that flow when you switch on circuit one and switch off circuit one. It's opposite directions of senses of EMFs that appear when you switch circuit one on, switch circuit two off. And that's because there's opposite changes in the flux of circuit one through circuit two, because it's that flux through circuit two from circuit one that is the vehicle of communicator. It's like the speech. That's how they talk and listen to one another through the changing flux. OK, I want to show you a, a illustration. Oops, what am I doing? <laughs> I have no idea where I'm going now. I want to show you um, an illustration. I want to show you a demonstration of two so circuits talking to one another. Um, and, and here is a cartoon of the demonstration I'm going to show you. So in this cartoon, I've got two circuits, two coils. One of them is connected to the power. I'm going to connect it actually just to a power outlet. And there'll be a current flowing through that circuit due to a EMF supplied to that circuit. And as you know, from a, 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 a power outlet, the current is varying in time. It's changing in time. The voltage is varying in time. It's changing in time. And so there's going to be a um, changing current through this circuit that's connected to the power outlet, a changing a, a voltage across this circuit that's connected to the power outlet. That's going to mean it's going to create a magnetic field, a changing magnetic field. It's going to create a flux, a changing magnetic flux, through this second circuit. This second circuit here is not connected to anything. It's just a coil of wire. It's just a solenoid of wire. It's not connected to anything. But we're going to induce a voltage across that circuit. We're going to induce a current through that circuit uh, through electromagnetic induction. And so we're going to look at that. Uh, this circuit, this arrangement of two circuits, is over here on the, um, on the left-hand side. Um, the circuit that's connected to the power is this coil here, this larger coil here. And maybe you can see that there's a wire that comes through the table here. And there's another wire coming through the table that's connected to the power supply down here. So that, that's one that's connected to power. And when we power it up, there's going to be a, a current. And there's going to be a voltage across that coil that's going to create a magnetic field, create a magnetic flux. And it's going to be varying with time at 60 hertz, 60 cycles a second. This coil, this is, um, this is 10,000 turns of coil. I don't know who wound this, but it was a, I mean, it was a heroic effort to wind it. 10,000 turns of coil. So this is bathed in that flux. It's bathed in that magnetic field. And because it's got so many turns, it's going to see a huge change in flux. And if it sees a huge change in flux, it's going to create a big EMF, electromotive force. It's going to create a big induced current. And so we're going to see that current. We're going to see that induced EMF by a spark that's going to leap between these two, uh, these two electrodes here. That's, that's why nobody is sitting in the, Don't worry too much. <laughs> Nobody's sitting in these rows here. So just to set the mood, I think, 
Um, I can't open the bar yet, but I can turn the lights out. And um, the, so I can't get near it either. Uh, so I've got a pedal to switch it on. So the moment I switch the pedal down, um, that's going to energize the power supply, energize the larger coil, and we're going to start inducing EMFs, inducing currents in the, um, in the 10,000 turn solenoid. So that's just an example that by having 10,000 turns, you can induce a huge, a huge EMF, induce a huge current. So we'll do it one more time or two more times. It's hard to believe, right? It's very hard to believe because that red solenoid, that red coil is not connected physically to anything. Yet despite the fact it's not physically connected to anything, there's a, there's a massive EMF, it's about a million volts, that's generated in that, in that coil. And there's a massive current that flows in that coil. It's a big enough EMF that it causes the air between the two electrodes to literally break down, to burn, ignite, and that's what you're seeing. That's the, the lightning that you're seeing, the spark that you're seeing between the two electrodes. So in case you didn't believe in um, uh, induction, I wanted to show you that one. It, it is a real effect, and it can be a very dramatic effect. And it's that induction that your iPhone is using. It's that induction that your um, laptop is using when connected to Wi-Fi. In general, the induced EMS, the induced currents, aren't big like that. That's a special setup to make a big induced current, big induced EMF. In general, we're in a cell phone, a laptop, the induced currents, the induced EMS are, kind of, are small. And so I just wanted to work through an example calculation. So in, in this problem, we've got two circuits. We've got a solenoid. That's the outer loop here. And in the interior, it, bathed in the magnetic field, we've got this rectangular loop. That's the inner loop here. We're told that the solenoid has um, 100 turns. It has a length of uh, 20 centimeters. And the current in the solenoid is increased from 0 amps to 3 amps in 3 seconds. So that's going to create a magnetic field in the solenoid. A changing magnetic field in the solenoid is going to create a flux and a changing flux in the solenoid. And so we're going to induce an EMF, induce a current in this rectangular coil. And we're going to calculate that induced EMF. OK. The, the, the induced EMF is due to a change in the flux through the circuit. And it's the rate of change of the flux through the square loop that determines the induced EMF in the square loop. So we've got to calculate the rate of change of flux. The way I'm going to do it is actually, initially, the flux in the field are 0. So initial flux in field are 0. Then after 3 seconds, the the flux is non-zero. The field is non-zero. I'm going to calculate the flux and field after three seconds. And then I'm going to calculate the change of flux for those three seconds based on that final flux and field, based on the fact we started from no flux and field, and that that took three seconds. So I'm going to do it in a couple of steps here. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is at, um, at three seconds, so maybe, let me write at, Three seconds. Let's calculate the, the magnetic field in the solenoid. If you remember, the magnetic field in the solenoid is mu naught times the number of turns per meter. I'm going to write that literally as the number of turns of the solenoid divided by the length of the solenoid times the current in the solenoid. Obviously, we need a current to make a magnetic field. All of these numbers we know, right? I know the the uh, constant mu naught, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 teslas meters over amps. 
I know uh, the number of turns and the length of the solenoid. Number of turns is 100. Length is 0.2 meters. And I know that after three seconds, the current in the solenoid is, is 3 amps. And so if I multiply all those things together, I got 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3, so it's milli teslas. That's the field in the solenoid, except I've run off the screen. We want the flux, because it's the change in flux, not the change in field, that directly creates the induced EMF, the induced current. Um, what, what's the flux? Well, the flux would be the field times the area of the surface over which we're calculating that flux times an angle, cosine theta, between the field's direction and the vector A's direction that represents the surface. Uh, the field is the field of the solenoid, so that's 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3 teslas. The area is, so let's be careful, the area is the area of the square coil because we want the, um, the EMF in the square coil. That was um, 1 times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared. It's 1 centimeter squared. And then the angle, that angle theta, that's the angle between two vectors, the B vector of the magnetic field, the A vector of the surface. They're actually parallel to one another. The, if you look at the sketch, the field is coming out of the screen. Um, if you look at the sketch, the vector that represents that surface area is perpendicular to the plane of the surface. It's also coming out of the screen. So this is cosine of 90. So this is really just 1. And um, if I multiply those numbers together, I get 1.9 times 10 to the minus 7 Webers. That's the units of flux. OK, so that was a calculation of the field and the flux at something that I had trouble with here. At three seconds. But we need the change of flux. We need change of field. That's what's creating induced EMF. That's what's creating an induced current. Um, so the induced EMF, so now I'm thinking about from zero to three seconds rather than at, at three seconds itself. The induced EMF, and I'm just going to worry about calculating the size, is going to be the change in flux. Again, I'm just worried about the size of the change in flux divided by the elapsed time. The change in flux was 1.9 times 10 to the minus 7 Webers. The elapsed time was at three seconds it took to switch the thing on. And then if I divide by one by the other, I get 6.3 times 10 to the minus 8 volts. That's 63 nano volts, 10 to the minus 9 volts. And so that's a calculation of the um, flux and the change of flux, and hence the induced EMF, and we could figure the induced current, in that little coil. In this case, this was a tiny induced EMF. It's tiny induced EMF because that was a one loop coil, right? That's one reason. Uh, this was 10,000 loops of coil. Also, this is a tiny induced EMF because this, this guy was just one square centimeter. This coil over here is much, much bigger in size, much greater in size. So those are two factors, the number of turns, the area of the solenoid or the area of the loop that have a huge impact on whether you're going to induce a large voltage, large current, or a small voltage, small current in a cell phone, in a um, laptop. The induced currents, the induced EMFs for the communication, wireless communication, are tiny currents, tiny voltages. Okay. got a quiz question. Come on. So this quiz question is about that example. And the question is, um, well, look, the current in the solenoid was going counterclockwise around the solenoid. That created a field out of the screen due to the solenoid. What's the direction of the, um, the current in the, uh, 
in the coil. So let me publish this. So, when, when electromagnetic induction occurs and you induce an EMF with some changing original field, say due to the solenoid, um, you create a new field, an induced field. And the rule for the induced field is that it's going to oppose the change of the original field. In this particular case, the field from the solenoid was as it was switched on, more and more field lines came out of the screen towards you. So Lenz's law that the induced field, due to the current in the coil, would try and oppose that change, is going to create a field that heads in towards the screen to try and cancel out, counteract the change that's going on. And so to understand the direction of the current in the coil, understand that the field created by the current in the coil is in towards the screen because it's trying to oppose the change. So I can use a right-hand rule, right, that in which I point my thumb in the direction of the field that I want to make with the current in the loop. And my fingers will curl in the direction of the current in the loop. They're curling clockwise. And so we get a current in the loop, the coil, rectangular coil that is clockwise, uh, and it's opposite the current in the, uh, in the solenoid that was flowing counterclockwise. Uh, it's opposite when you switch the solenoid on. So when you ramp the solenoid's current up and you try and oppose the change, you get an opposite direction current in the uh, coil. If we were to switch the solenoid off, you actually get the two currents in the same direction because the current in the coil is trying to replace the field that was due to the solenoid. And so they're not always as important. They're not always in opposite directions. The rule is that the induced current is opposing the change in the um, uh, original magnetic field by creating its own magnetic field. OK, let's look at transformer induction now for a single circuit. So this is an interesting case. You might not have thought about this. We've been looking at one circuit talking to another circuit. But actually, I can talk to myself. And circuits can talk to themselves. And circuits do talk to themselves when the currents in the circuits are changing with time. And that's, um, that's called self-induction. It's called self-inductance. So this is a slide, an overhead, to indicate how, how that works. So in this slide, I've only got one circuit. I've got a circuit that's just made of a solenoid, obviously connected to some source of um, some power, some source of current, e of EMF. Um, here's the, here's that, here's that um, on the left-hand side, here's that circuit. Um, in this particular case, on the left, I'm imagining that the current is flowing in the circuit, but it's not changing. And then I've got two more sketches of the same circuit, right? In the center, the current is flowing in the circuit, but it's increasing. And on the uh, right here, the current is flowing in the circuit, uh, and it's decreasing. What we're going to look at what we're going to think about to understand self-induction, a circuit talking to itself, is we're not going to think so much about the field that's created by the circuit or the flux that's created by the circuit. We're going to think about the changing flux that's created by the circuit. So when the current is constant over here on the left, this is 
got lost off the edge of the screen, but the change in flux, change in magnetic flux is zero. The current's constant, the field is constant, the flux is constant, there's no change in flux. In this case, th there's no talking of the circuit to itself. Case in the middle. Now we're increasing the current that's flowing in the circuit. If we're increasing the current flowing in the circuit, we're increasing the field between the windings of the circuit. We're increasing the flux through the windings of the circuit. That's going to induce an EMF. It's going to induce a current. Here the circuit is talking to itself because the, um, the current, the field, the flux are changing. And here we get an induced EMF, an induced, an induced current that depend on the rate of change of the flux through the circuit. This is a second case where the circuit talks to itself. In this particular case, um, the current is decreasing. So if the current is decreasing, the magnetic field is decreasing. The magnetic flux is decreasing. So we've got a changing flux. And so again, we induce an EMF. We induce a current. So a single first message is that a single circuit can talk to itself. A single circuit can induce a current, an EMF, in itself. It can induce a current EMF in itself if the current that's flowing in the circuit, if the voltage applied to the circuit, is itself changing. That creates an induced EMF. It creates an induced EMF. One question is, what's the direction? An important question is, what's the direction of the induced EMF, induced current? The direction is, again, given by Lenz's law. So the dire direction of the induced current, for example, is in a direction that opposes the change. So if you're increasing the current, then the induced current will be in the opposite direction to oppose the change. If you're reducing the current, decreasing the current, then the induced current will be in the same direction again to try and counteract the change. So when you raise the current in the solenoid in this sketch here, um, you get an induced current It flows in the opposite direction to the original current. When you lower the current in the solenoid, then you get an induced current that flows in the same direction as the original current. And, and they're both, what they're both doing is trying to um, counteract the change trying to cancel out the change through their directions of their currents and the resulting fields and the resulting fluxes. On this slide, I want to introduce this new term for this class that we're going to start talking about, and that's self-inductance. So self-inductance is a quantity that describes the amount that which one circuit talks to itself. If the self-inductance is large for a circuit, that circuit talks to itself loudly or a lot. If the induct self-inductance is small, that circuit talks to itself just a little bit, quietly. I mean, it's like a number that would, say, describe, how much do I talk to myself? Well, maybe I do it in the morning when I get up or go to bed or whatever. I, I talk to myself a bit, but not ho the whole day long, right? So I've got a certain inductance. Um, uh, let's see, my kids, how much do they talk to themselves? They talk to themselves constantly, all day long, forever. Um, so they've got a big self-inductance. So th this does the same thing for electrical circuits. This is specifically, look at this, there's an equation on here, buried in this great mass of words. Um, this is specifically how we define self-inductance. For some reason, the self-inductance is given the symbol uppercase L. The self-inductance is a proportionality constant. It's a proportionality constant between what I would call the cause of the circuit talking to itself, that's a changing current. So this guy here, delta I over delta T, that's the rate of change of the current. And the result 
of talking to itself. The result of talking to itself is you get a change in flux through the circuit. That's this delta phi over delta t. And so L is a proportionality constant between the cause and the effect. The changing current uh, is the cause, the, the changing flux is the effect that cause the, causes the talking. Self-inductance, like inductance, like capacitance, is, is just a number. We don't talk about positive, negative capacitance. We don't talk about positive, negative inductance. It's, it is just a number. So don't worry about plus and minus signs in, in, a, in this definition. The inductance itself is just a positive number, representing this proportionality between the, the rate of change of the current and the rate of change of the flux. It's actually also the proportionality at any moment between literally the current and the flux. So L is a proportionality constant between the rate at which the current and the flux are changing. It's also a proportionality constant between the, the current itself in the circuit and the flux through the circuit. OK. I think I wanted to show you a demonstration of it. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to put the camera on for this one because it's not, it's not a big dramatic smart spark like the last one. Okay. So in this demonstration, I've got a, uh, a little neon lamp here. It's a little um, fluorescent lamp, actually. It's, it's very small. You can barely see it. Uh, and I've got a 9-volt battery. And the neon lamp, to light the neon lamp, takes 60 volts. And the 9-volt battery supplies 9 volts. So, you know, I can't light the lamp with the 9-volt battery. This lamp is not lit with the 9-volt battery. That's not possible. However, I got another circuit it's down here, which has a, another 9-volt battery, another lamp, but also in the circuit is a coil. So it's like this circuit, but I've added a coil in here, a solenoid in here. And I've also added a switch. I feel like a CNN cameraman or something doing this. Um, I've added a switch. Now, why did I do all that? I did all that in an attempt to use self-inductance, to use induced EMFs, induced currents, to light a 60-volt lamp with a 9-volt battery. This seems impossible. You can't light a 60-volt lamp with a 9-volt battery, but you can if you've also got an inductor. When I switch on the circuit, what's going to happen is... Uh, will there be the current from the battery and the voltage from the battery? But now I've got the solenoid, the inductor in the circuit. I'll get an induced EMF in the inductor. And that induced EMF in the inductor, that could be much larger. It actually is going to be large enough that I can light the lamp with the induced EMF. Uh, although I can't light the lamp with the um, EMF from the battery. And so um, in, in this little arrangement, we've got two EMFs, one coming from the batteries. It's 9 volts. Its source is chemical. And then we've got another EMF. It's coming from the inductor, and its source is a changing magnetic field. And um, one of them, when I sit, switch the circuit on, the battery is always going to be there. That 9 volts is always going to be there. The other one from the inductor, that's just going to be present at the moment I switch the circuit on, when there's a change, and the moment I switch the circuit off. Okay.
So now I've told you all that. I'm going to again set the mood. And um, I'm going to press the switch to make the circuit. Watch the lamp when I do that. Oh, it's not working. <laughs> Great. Why is it not working? Oh, there it is. OK. Take that all back. I can't operate a simple switch. I'm going to switch it on now. Watch the lamp. See that flash? OK. Right now, there's 9 volts connected to the battery. The battery has been connected to the lamp. The lamp is not lit, because that's not enough. But at the moment I closed the switch, the lamp did flash on. It was lit. That EMF was coming from the inductor due to its self-inductance, due to the fact it induced an EMF in itself because of the self-inductor. The moment I switch the circuit off, I'm going to do that now, it flashes on again. Again, that's not an EMF that's come from the battery. That's an EMF that's come from the inductor. It's induced in itself an EMF that's much bigger than the 60 volts because of the, um, the changing current through the circuit. And so that's an example of um, self-inductance. Just to drive home the definition of self-inductance, um, I've got this little example here. A 24 millivolt EMF, induced EMF, is produced in a 500 turn coil when the uh, rate of change of current is 10 amps per second. There's a bunch of information that we're told here. We've got to calculate the self-inductance. Remember, the self-inductance is the, the coefficient and proportionality between the rate of change of current, which we're told in this problem, and the, um, that, so that's the cause of the induction, and the rate of change of flux. That's the result. We're told the rate of change of flux in this problem. It, it may be not obvious, but the induced EMF is the rate of change of flux. That's Faraday's law. So in this problem, the first point is that we are told the cause of the induction, and we're told the rate of the induction, the, the result of the induction. The cause of the induction is the rate of change of current. It's 10 amps per second. The, um, uh, the effect of the induction, the result of the induction, is a induced EMF, or a rate of change of flux, that's, um, that's 24 millivolts. And so all we've got to do is find the proportionality constant, which we call the self-inductance, between those two things. And so that's all we've got to do to um, solve this problem. The 500 turns is a red herring. It, it's not relevant to, to this. All we need to know is the cause of the induction and the result of the induction. So here's our equation that defines flux, sorry, defines self-inductance. Here's the cause, the rate of change of currents. Here's the, um, the result. I've written it, I could have written d phi dt here, because that's the change in flux. But the d phi dt is equal to the induced EMF. So I wrote, wrote it as induced EMF, because that's what we're told. All I've got to do is rearrange this definition here of self-inductance as a proportionality constant. The self-inductance is the result, the rate of change of flux or induced EMF divided by the cause, the current change, the rate of change of current. So it's 0 0.024 volts divided by 10 amps per second is 2.4 millihenries. And so that's that calculation. OK, I mentioned at the beginning of class that uh, capacitors are components in circuits. Inductors are also components in circuits. And in any circuit, like a, a phone or a laptop, 
there are lots and lots and lots of uh, capacitors and inductors. Your phone, your laptop is filled with inductors and capacitors. I want to compare the definition of the capacitance of a capacitor, so that's this top half of the screen here, with the inductance of an inductor. That's the bottom half of the screen here. If we want to imagine a, a sort of typical capacitor or prototype capacitor, uh, archetypal capacitor, let's imagine the parallel plate capacitor over here. This is a place where we can store charge on the plates. If we want to imagine our inductor, we can imagine this sort of prototype or archetypal inductor. It's a winding of a coil. This is, this is what an inductor looks like. So in the capacitor, what you're doing is storing charge. In the inductor, really what you're doing is um, making flux. Those are the analogies to one another. We store charge on the place of the capacitor. We make flux between the windings of the inductor. That's an analogy. Uh, we make, we apply the charge, when you apply the charge on the place of the capacitor, um, uh, there's a voltage that's needed to uh, um, create that, that potential difference, but that, that charge on the place of the capacitor. And when you um, uh, make a flux through the windings of a solenoid or an inductor, you need a current to flow through the windings of the solenoid. And so capacitance is the relationship between the charge on the plates and the voltage between the plates. And it parallels inductance being the ratio between the uh, flux through the windings of the solenoid divided by the current that's flowing through the windings of the solenoid. So both capacitance and inductance are sort of proportionality constants between the, um, the workings or the nature of a capacitor uh, or an inductor. And what a capacitor does in terms of storing charge by applying voltage to it, what an inductor does in terms of storing um, or making flux by passing a current through it. And so this just draws the analogy between capacitance and inductance. For that archetypal parallel plate capacitor, there was an equation that we met that told us the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor in terms of the size of the plates and the separation between the plates and a constant describing electricity. There's a similar equation that I want to introduce for the inductance of an inductor, this archetypal inductor that's a, a, a solenoid or loops of wire. It's, it's this equation here. Again, it's an equation that tells you the inductance of a solenoid inductor in terms of the geometry of the solenoid inductor. So it has the, um, the length of the inductor. It has the cross-sectional area of the inductor. And it also has here, this is the number of turns per unit length of the inductor. These are all ge geometrical things about this or that inductor, like the area of the plates and the separation between the plates was geometrical things about a particular parallel plate capacitor. Like we had a constant, you know, capacitor is an electrical device. So in the capacitance, there's a constant describing electricity. It's uh, the electric permeativity. I, I, a inductor is a magnetic device. In the equation for the inductance, there's a, um, a constant describing magnetism. It's the magnetic permeability. It's this mu naught here. So again, this, this slide is drawing another analogy between the capacitance of an archetypal parallel plate capacitor and an archetypal uh, uh, solenoidal in, inductor in terms of the geometries of the parallel plate capacitor and what's important about the geometry and the geometries of the inductor, what's important about the um, geometries of the inductor. Note the capacitance here doesn't depend on how much charge you store or how much voltage you created between the plates. The inductance of the inductor doesn't depend on how much current you flowed or how much flux you made between the windings of the solenoid. The 
capacitance of the capacitor, the inductance of the inductor, are geometrical things about the size, shape of the inductor or the capacitor. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate a um, inductance of a inductor, of a solenoid inductor, just like we calculated the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. In this particular question, we're told that we've got a, um, uh, a solenoidal inductor. We want to calculate its self-inductance. We're told it has 200 turns. We're told its length is 5 centimeters. And we're told its cross-sectional area is 4 squared centimeters. Now, before I go on and, and do the calculation, we've been told the geometry of the inductor, I want to say, because sometimes this gets mixed up, that there's two ways you can write, and there's two ways we do write, the inductance of a solenoidal inductor. One way you can write it is in terms of the total number of turns of the inductor, of the solenoid. And another way you can write it is in terms of the number of turns per unit length of the solenoidal inductor. So uh, the number of turns is the uppercase M. And the number of turns per unit length is the lowercase M. And you can write it in terms, the self-inductance in terms of uppercase N or lowercase N. On the previous slide, we wrote it in terms of lowercase n, the number of turns per unit length. But on this slide, I wanted to show you that you could write it in terms of uppercase n, the total number of turns also. So that's the two equations here. So I've highlighted, this is the equation from the last slide. This lowercase n is the number of turns per unit length. Uh, this uppercase n, this other way of writing it, is this is the total number of turns. This is the uppercase n. Now, if you change lowercase n to uppercase n, something else has to change. You'll notice that L, the length of the solenoid, is in the numerator here. L, the length of the solenoid, is in the denominator here. So these are just two ways. Sometimes it's handy if you know the number of turns to use one. Sometimes it's handier if you know the number of turns per unit length to use the other one. Um, but we want to... Um, not, not get confused about them. There are two ways of writing this, and we frequently use these two ways of writing this. So let, let's do the calculation. I'll, I'll do this on the, um, the, the device that I don't know the name of. very disorientated by looking over here and trying to move. It's like I can't move my hand and coordinate it with my eyes anymore. Maybe just old age is, is the cause of that. Um, and, and now I've completely forgotten what I was doing, so, which is definitely a sign of old age. Um, Thinks for a moment. Yeah, I'm going to solve this problem where we've got a solenoidal inductor and we want to calculate its self-inductance. Remember, we're calculating how much it talks to itself, whether it talks to itself a lot or talks to itself just a little. I started the problem. I wrote down the things we were told about the inductor. It has 200 turns. It has a length that's... Um, five centimeters or 0 0.05 meters. It has a cross-sectional area. It's four se square centimeters, uh, or that's four times 10 to the minus four uh, meters squared. We want to calculate the self-inductance as L. And I'm going to use the formula, since we know the total number of turns, I'm going to use the formula with the total number of turns, where it's mu naught uppercase n squared times a divided by L. Every number in this equation I know, right? So 4 pi times 10, uh, times 10 to the minus 7 teslas, meters over amps. Uh, number of turns, 200. 
the area, cross-sectional area. Remember, I have to get it in the right units, SI units. So it's 4, pi, four times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared. And then finally, um, got to divide by the length of the solenoid. It was, uh, it was 5 centimeters, so that's 0 0.05 meters. If we multiply all those things together, we get a self-inductance. The number I got is, um, it was 4 times 10 to the minus 4. So it's 0.4 milli henrys. Henrys is the units of a self-inductance. Remember Henry. I, I brought him up, um, kind of weird way to say it, but I brought him up in an earlier class, a few classes ago. He was there at the beginnings of um, induction with Faraday. Uh, in, in the discovery and application of induction. And, and so we're, we're celebrating Henry with his units um, and for his work on induction. Um, anyway, that's that problem solved. I want to, in the last 20 minutes or so, talk about the process of um, energizing an inductor, That's switching it on, fancy word for that, and um, de-energizing an inductor, switching it off, fancy word for that. So we're going to talk about those cases. We're also going to talk about the energy that's stored in the inductor in analogy with the energy that's stored in a capacitor. They both store energy. They both store either electrical or magnetic energy, what we would call electromagnetic energy. Okay, so over the next three slides, I'm going to introduce an equation for the current in an inductor when you switch that inductor on, and, the, um, uh, and we'll sketch that equation for the current in the inductor when we switch it on. When you switch on the inductor, the current importantly, right? The current just doesn't go from zero to full current in an instant. It doesn't go from zero to full current in an instant because of the induced EMFs, induced currents, that try and counteract the change, try and cancel out the change. So because of the induced currents, induced EMFs, trying to cancel out, uh, um, counteract the change, the current grows from zero to full current over some period of time. It just doesn't jump from zero to full current instantaneously. So here's a circuit. It's got a, um, f some familiar components now. So we've got a battery, we've got a resistor, and we've got an uh, inductor, and we've got a switch. And by energizing the inductor, me I mean, well, I'm just going to close the switch. The switch was open, so there was no current flowing through the circuit. The inductor was not energized. And then I'm going to close the switch at time t equals 0, and we're going to get a current flowing through the circuit, and we're going to energize the inductor. There will be current in the circuit. At time t equals 0, we know that the, um, the current is 0, and that the inductor is not energized. If we were to wait a long time, infinite time, after closing the switch, we know that the, there would be a current in the circuit and the inductor would be fully energized. And actually, if you wait a long time, you can figure out the current that's going around this circuit, going around this circuit here, simply based on the EMF and the resistance of the resistor. We've got an EMF, a battery that supplies an EMF. It's applied to a resistor in this circuit. That determines by Ohm's law the current in the circuit. It's just the EMF divided by the resistance. So really, the big question is here, how do you get from 0 to epsilon over R, the final current, after the moment you switch on the circuit? How do you get from the current being 0 to the current being epsilon over R over some period of time, and what is that period of time? That's the big question. Well, here's the answer. 
the current grows in the circuit after you close the switch according to this formula here. So on the left-hand side of this formula is current I as a function of time. So I'm supplying with this formula the answer to the question, how does the current change as a function of time? The current is a function of time. This is how it changes with time. Over on the right-hand side, of course, you see that there must be time in it to describe the time dependence. So there's this time in the exponent of the exponential here. Let's look at this equation. It looks mildly scary, but let's walk our way through it by thinking about what it looks like when uh, time is zero, what it looks like when time is large. When time is zero, the exponent of the exponential is zero. E to the zero is one. So in parentheses, you've got one minus one. This equation says that when time is zero, you've got no current which is where we're going to start at. This equation also says, if we think about time being very large, think about this time t being a very large number, then that's the, the exponent now of the exponential is a very large negative number. The e to the minus very large negative number, that's actually zero. So when this second piece in parentheses becomes zero, uh, the quantity in parentheses just becomes the one, and we get that final current that's flowing in the circuit. It's the battery in MF divided by the, the resistance of the resistor. So that makes sense too. So firstly, this equation does follow our intuition that we start with zero current and we end up with a current that's the EMF divided by the resistance given by Ohm's law. So it fulfills, uh, fulfills our intuition. So that's kind of nice and reassuring to us. But it also tells us how you get from t equals zero to t being very large. And it tells you how you get there through this exponential time dependence. And that exponential time dependence has a time constant to it. It has a time scale to it. It has a time scale that's built into this formula that's determined by the resistance of the resistor and the inductance of the inductor. So the time constant that's built into this equation is equal, that time constant tau is equal to the ratio of the inductance divided by the resistance. If that number is large, supposing L over R, your Henry's of inductance divided by your ohms of resistance, if that number's large, then it's going to take a long time to energize that inductor. There's going to be a long period of time in which the current is growing from no current to full current. If that ratio of Henry's of inductance to ohms of resistance is small, is tiny, then it's going to be quick to energize the inductor. It's just going to be a short amount of time to go from no current to um, a final current, uh, the, the final full current. And so that time constant is very important. Well, we can look at a graph or a plot or a drawing of that equation. That might help us. Horizontally is time. And vertically is the current. So this is, uh, time is the depend independent variable. Uh, current here is the dependent variable. It's telling us how the current changes with time. That's the red line here. It's the current changing with time. You see that at time zero, the current is zero. We just close the switch here. At large times, the current will reach the full current, the battery EMF divided by the resistance of the resistor. The growth of the current from no current to full current is given by this equation. It's this curve here. This red curve is just a plot of this equation. The rate at which the current glows, grows is determined by this ratio inductance to resistance. So if I had plotted this for a circuit that had a larger ratio of inductance to resistance, this curve would grow more slowly. 
if I plotted it for a, a different circuit that had a smaller ratio of inductance to resistance, this plot would have grown more quickly. And so it's setting the time scale for the growth from zero current to, to full current. And, and that's all embedded in this master equation here. Okay. Now let's imagine we want to um, turn off the energized inductor. And uh, how long does it take to de-energize the inductor? Again, the inductor doesn't de-energize instantaneously. You turn off the circuit. The current in the circuit doesn't vanish instantaneously. You open the switch in the circuit. That's because when you try and make a change to the circuit, this time we're trying to de-energize the circuit, you're going to induce EMFs. You're going to induce currents in the inductor. When you induce the EMFs, you induce indu uh, currents in the inductor, they're opposing the change. They're trying to counteract the change. They're trying to um, uh, cancel out the change. And so you might have disconnected the inductor from the battery or disconnected the inductor from the power supply, but that inductor is going to be responding by creating its own EMF, creating its own induced current uh, to try and counteract that change. And so it takes a while to de-energize an inductor. It takes some period of time to de-energize the inductor from the original full current down to zero current. And the question is, what is the equation that describes that maps out how the current in the inductor falls off with time when you de-energize the uh, inductor. So we're going to look at that. Here's the circuit to think of when, when de-energizing the inductor. So if you think about this circuit, it looks a bit more complicated. It's not too much more complicated. We've got a battery, we've got a switch, we've got a resistor and an inductor. So we've got the same components. If the two-way switch is in position A, this is how we charge up, not charge up. This is how we energize the inductor, having the switch in A. If you open the switch and make contact with B, then this is how you de-energize the inductor. You've got a complete circuit again now, but you've removed the battery from the circuit. And so ultimately, there'll be no current flowing in the circuit because there's no source of energy to drive the current through the circuit and drive the current through the resistor. So, initially when the switch is at A, the current that's flowing in the circuit is just determined by Ohm's law, is determined by the EMF of the battery, the resistance of the resistor. The current in the circuit is epsilon over R, the EMF divided by the resistance. That's at time zero. We open the switch, and then we know that if we wait long enough, once we've, we, we've um, removed the battery from the circuit, that current must vanish, because that battery has vanished. And so ultimately, we must get zero current in the circuit. Zero current through the inductor, zero current through the resistor. So at large times, we know we've got to get zero current. The question is, Again, how do we get from full current, epsilon over R, to no current, zero? How do we get from one to the other? It's not happening instantaneously. It's happening over some period of time because of the induced EMFs, because of the induced currents. Well, you'll be pleased to know there's, there's an equation that describes that too. This is the current as a function of time when you de-energize an inductor. So over on the left-hand side again is our current and it's varying with time. That's what I mean by I as a function of T. On the right-hand side is an equation that describes exactly that time dependence. So in that equation you see the time T. It's in the exponent of the exponential. We can check that equation agrees with our intuition about how this must work. At time zero, the current must be the full current, epsilon over R. At long times after we, close the, uh, after we remove the battery from the circuit, the current must be zero. It must have vanished. So if we plug in time equals zero in here, e to the zero, 
e to the 0 is 1. e to the 0 is 1. And so the current is the EMF divided by the resistance. If we plug in a big time, infinite time, into the T in the equation on the right-hand side, then this is E to the minus a very large number in the exponent. E to the minus a very large number is 0. And so the exponential becomes 0, the current becomes 0. So this equation clearly does obey our intuition, that's good, that we start with full current, we're going to end up with no current. But it tells us more. It tells us exactly how you get from, zero, from full current to zero current. And you get there with a time scale that's determined by the time constant again. The time constant of the circuit is L over R, Henry's over ohms. If Henry's over ohms for your resistor and your inductor is a large number, then it's going to take a long time to de-energize the inductor. If Henry's over ohms is a small number, then it, the inductor's going to de-energize quickly, relatively quickly. And so this time constant tells us how, how fast or slow we, we de-energize the inductor. And of course, it's the same time constant that's associated with how fast or slow we energize an inductor. We can graph that, of course. Here's the equation. And here's the picture of the equation. Horizontal axis, time independent variable. Vertical axis, current, dependent variable. Red curve is current versus time, how the current is changing with time. At time zero, right, it's the full current, EMF over resistance. At, at long times, after long times, it's zero current. The curve describes, the equation describes how we get from full current to zero current. If I had drawn the case of a um, a circuit with a larger time constant, larger L over R, it would take longer. If I had drawn the, the, the curve for a circuit with a smaller time constant, then it would have uh, gone to zero more quickly. And so the time constant is set in the scale, the time scale for this curve. OK. You might wonder how it could be, I mean, or you might not, but you might have wondered how it could be that, that a Henry divided by an ohm, the ratio of two units of two physics celebrities, is a unit of time. L over R is a time. It's a time scale. How could it be that a Henry from magnetism and a um, resistance ohm from electric circuits, how could that have the units of time? And so that's what I'm trying to show you on, on this particular slide. The way to think about a way to think about it, if you were wondering about it, is to think about these two equations. This is Faraday's law. We've been talking about that a lot recently. This was Ohm's law. We were talking about that a lot about that earlier. They both, on the left-hand side, have volts, potentials. They both have the same units on the left-hand side. So they both must have the same units on the right-hand side. This stuff here, self-inductance times rate of change of currents, must have the units of volts. This stuff here, current times resistance, must have the the, um, uh, the units of volts. So let me do the following thing. Imagine I divide the right-hand side of Faraday's law by the right-hand side of Ohm's law. What am I doing then? I'm making something that's dimensionless. The right-hand side of Faraday's law has dimensions of volts. The right-hand side of Ohm's law has dimensions of volts. The ratio of the two right-hand sides will have no dimensions whatsoever because it's volts over volts. Whatever's in that ratio, the units cancel out perfectly to make a dimensionless quantity. And so 
That's what I wrote down here. So this L times rate of change of current, that's the right-hand side of Faraday's law, divided by IR, current times resistance, that's the right-hand side of Ohm's law. Um, I just rearranged them a little bit into two terms here. So I combine, combine the L over R, I mean, obviously, because we're asking a question about L over R. Uh, and I combine the, um, the two versions of the current. Here's a rate of change of current, and here's a current. So the units of L over R must be such that they cancel the units of rate of change of current over current, because this is dimensionless. What are the units of rate of change of current over current? Current is measured in amps. Rate of change of current is measured in amps per second. Amps per second over amps is, the amps cancel out, is just per second. So the units of um, rate of change of current, di, uh, delta I over delta T, divided by current, I, is just inverse seconds. If the units of the delta I of the delta T divided by I term is inverse seconds, then it must be that the units of L over R are seconds, so that the equation overall is dimensionless. And so we've just proved that whilst it may seem, seem bizarre, right, that, or peculiar, or um, I can't think of another theosaurus word, um, that L over R, ohm, uh, sorry, Henry's over ohms could be a uh, time. It is literally a time. It is a time scale. Okay. Got a couple of minutes left. Got one minute. I just wanted to show you um, this one slide. A capacitor stores energy as well as storing charge. And we met equations for the energy stored in a capacitor. Uh, we met one half CV squared. V is the voltage across the plate, C is the capacitance of the capacitor. This is the potential energy that's stored in the electrical field of the capacitor. A inductor stores energy. You can write an equation, a similar equation for the energy that's stored in an inductor. That's this equation here. It's um, the current that's flowing through the windings of the inductor times the inductance of the inductor. It's one half L I squared. That's the potential energy that's stored in an inductor. It's stored in a magnetic field. The capacitor stores it in an electrical field, but they both store electromagnetic energy due to the currents, due to the voltages across their plates. 